Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to the first of March. Spring is around the corner. Um, I want to say, please turn off your cell phones. And the second thing I want to say is several people have asked if we're going to have a trip this um, next semester. Um, we would like very much to have your ideas on a kind of a trip you would like to take. We don't know what our schedule is for next semester, but if you've got some ideas, we would very much appreciate it. You can leave them at the membership desk, or you can contact me, and my um, info is on the brochure in on the website. And so now Sandy will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have the pleasure today of having with us uh, T.J. Donovan, or Thomas, I guess John Donovan, is that right, T.J.? But everybody, uh, James, sorry. Um, but everybody knows him as T.J. T.J. is now the Attorney General of the state of Vermont and has been so for two elections, is that right? He's been elected for two terms. He is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the state of Vermont, whatever that means, and I'm sure that he'll tell us what it means. <laughs> Um, he uh, is a graduate of Merrimack College and also Suffolk Law School. He served in the Chittenden County State's Attorney's Office where he was a prosecutor. He is a person that really, I believe, serves the people of Vermont because he does a lot of personal constituent work and I've seen really very few politicians who take that as seriously as does TJ. So he's with us today to talk about various subjects, the rule of law, prison reform, but he's also here to answer questions because I'm sure you all have a lot of questions about the role of the Attorney General and the rule of law at this particular moment in our history. So thank you, here's TJ. Thank you, Sandy. It's uh, good to know that after all these years of friendship, you still don't know my name. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for that introduction. Uh, I want to acknowledge my high school history teacher who I just saw here, that's Chippy Kane. Uh, I think the first and one of the few A's I ever got was uh, a, a report on the Civil War in Chippy's American history class. And I, I think Chippy probably knew this, but I also think it was the time of Ken Burns' wonderful documentary on the Civil War. And, I happened to do a report on the Civil War, and it just <laughs> kind of all worked out. Uh, but but um, I will say this, you know, and I don't know another teacher who I see often, who I'm sure many of you know. Uh, I grew up in Burlington, and I went to Burlington Public Schools, um, and Chippy certainly was one of the, the best teachers. Um, and I also see another teacher, I don't think she's here, but I'm sure she would might come to this, a Ducky Donath. Oh, yeah. uh, great lady, my fourth grade teacher, um, and I see her quite often. Uh, so I'm happy, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to talk um, about the Attorney General's Office, about the criminal justice system, about the rule of law, about some current cases, but really just happy to take questions from folks um, uh, as well. So about 45 minutes? Okay. So the Attorney General's Office is the chief law enforcement officer for the state, and Sandy raises a really good question. What does that mean? Uh, and it means a lot of different things. And it gets really confusing when you start saying, who does the attorney general actually represent? Does it represent the people of the state of Vermont? Well, certainly it does in uh, civil rights actions or environmental uh, protection actions. Or does it represent the state of Vermont as a legal entity? And yes, we do. We represent all state agencies. And any time the state of Vermont gets sued, uh, we defend the state of Vermont. And I got to tell you, we get sued a lot. The state of Vermont gets sued a lot. Last year, we just made this presentation um, to the House uh, appropriations because I had to go in for our budget. And I was incredibly surprised by this. There was over 500 lawsuits last year. Yeah, 500. So anytime there's a lawsuit against the state, we defend it. And 
let me just say a little bit about the Attorney General's office. Um, there's about 90 lawyers, so it's the biggest law firm in the state. Uh, the lawyers are littered throughout state government, um, so you definitely have you know, your core uh, groups of lawyers, whether it's your criminal division, whether it's your environmental division, whether it's your public protection division, which is consumer protection and, cons and cons um, civil rights, uh, whether it is uh, the civil division, which defends state government. Uh, then we represent the Agency of Human Services, which is the largest part of state government. And we have a bunch of lawyers uh, over there, whether it's representing the Department of Corrections, whether Department of Ind uh, Independent, uh, uh, Dale, Department of Aging and Independent Living. And we also represent, we also have a division called General Counsel, which we are the legal officers for state uh, agencies, uh, like the tax department. So really any issue that's going on in state government, we're involved in, uh, in terms of the legal work. And it's a lot. Uh, as I said, it's the largest law firm in the state. Our budget's about 12 million bucks, which isn't that big. It's mostly personnel, salaries, and benefits for uh, lawyers and staff. And any major issue going on in this state, uh, we're involved in, whether it's the EB-5 uh, case up in Newport, uh, whether it's um, uh, the Kaya Morris uh, case in Bennington that I'm happy to talk about, uh, whether it's the closure of the Vermont Yankee uh, nuclear uh, power plant we're involved in. So the portfolio is really, really expansive. Um, in terms of criminal jurisdiction, uh, we have what's called concurrent juris jurisdiction with the 14 elected states attorneys, which means that although rare, we can go into any county and bring a case, uh, essentially, if, if we want. That's somewhat rare, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit. And part of that causes, I, I think, and I'll touch on this a little bit uh, based on Sandy's introduction about what's going on in the criminal justice system. We spend a lot of money on the criminal justice system in Vermont. Uh, we spend more money on our Department of Corrections, which are our jails, essentially, than we do on higher education. I, yeah, I, I don't think that's a priority anybody supports. Um, I don't have the exact number in terms of what the DOC budget is, but it's, a, it's over $150 million. And the cost is actually quite outrageous when you look at it and you start looking at outcomes. To incarcerate a woman in the state of Vermont, it's about $79,000 a year. To incarcerate a man, it's about $60,000 a year. And the difference on that is really mental health treatment for women. Um, and I would say this about the reason why uh, the need is so great for women. Because most women who are in jail are victims of some sort of trauma that was never treated, that was never diagnosed, and they end up in jail. And you want to talk about domestic violence, you want to talk about sexual violence, you want to talk about emotional abuse, it's all there. Uh, it's in jail. That's not to excuse personal responsibility. It's perhaps to acknowledge some of the circumstances uh, where people are at time at the time a crime is committed uh, to really understand what's going on in somebody's life. My view, now, we're having a debate in this state about incarcerating people out of state. Uh, we contract, the state of Vermont contracts with a for-profit prison company, Core Civic, I believe, uh, down in Mississippi for about 250 Vermont inmates. Uh, I don't agree with that because, first of all, the job or the duty, I should say, to incarcerate somebody is the role of government. It's the role of government. And when you really think about it, and this gets into the, the rule of law issue a little bit, anytime there's a criminal charge, um, one thing is going to be the same in 14 counties you're gonna have what's called an information. And that's really the charging document uh, that's produced. And on that, there's gonna be a couple things. It's gonna outline the facts of the allegation of the crime. It's gonna give you the, the minimum, I should say the maximum jail sentence and the maximum financial penalty. But every information is gonna have the same language on the bottom of it. Doesn't matter if it's in Bennington County or Caledonia County. 
against the peace and dignity of the state of Vermont. And what that means is that the crime is committed against the state. Yes, there are victims of crime, yes. But the crime against the peace and dignity against the state of Vermont. And when you think about that, when the, the, because of course it is the government, the state, who is the prosecutor, the state of Vermont, who is, it's an extraordinary thing that to say to a citizen that you violated our rules and we, as a punishment, are gonna physically remove you from our community. And that's how I think about jail. We, are, we physically remove people from our community and put them in a box. That's an extraordinary thing to do. And I think one of the issues about what we need to do a better job in terms of the criminal justice system, and prosecutors are a big part of this, is we're very cavalier about time. We're very cavalier about time. And we throw out years and months like they mean nothing. And having been a prosecutor for most of my life, I'm guilty of it. I think I evolved over the course of time because I can tell you this about the criminal justice system, that it, it for me, as when I was Chittenden County State's Attorney, it was that definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, but <laughs> expecting a different result. <laughs> and at some point in time, you, you, once, you, once you saw the same people day in and day out, you'd have to say, wait a minute, this isn't working. And then you add in the, the fact of who do you actually see in the criminal justice system. And as I said, I was, I was lucky. I grew up in Burlington. I grew up in a, in a middle class family in the South End. Um, and I went to, to public school. Uh, and I had, a, I had a good upbringing. That was probably one of the best things that prepared me to be a local prosecutor. Because I saw a lot of the kids who I grew up with and went to Burlington High School with. Um, and perhaps didn't know them, but knew their family. And it does matter where you grow up. It does matter what schools you go to. It does matter what family you come from. And we talk about this issue of inequality all the time in politics right now, rightfully so. It is amplified in the criminal justice system because who you see in the criminal justice system are the poor. Increasingly people of color in this state, but mostly the poor, who suffer from addiction, who suffer from mental illness, who have maybe a high school uh, degree, who are un unemployed or underemployed. And you have to ask yourself the question, do the, do the poor have a monopoly on committing crime? Well, of course they don't. But why are they overrepresented in our court system and our jails? And it raises real issues about how we define what a safe and vibrant community is for everybody. And my evolution as a prosecutor really was to expand that definition, not just about a courthouse, not just about a jail, but about access to health care, mental health care, making sure that we had folks who could get into treatment who were struggling with addiction. But even going back earlier to that, true investments in our community, early childhood education, good public schools, affordable housing so people can be rooted and can stay in their community, access to affordable higher education, all the foundational things about what we talk about a safe environment community, that's what we actually need prosecutors to be talking about, to actually redefine what, what a vibrant community looks like. It's not about jails, it's not about courthouses, it's about the, the foundational aspects of what we define community as. It's about this. And I'll just give a quick contrast in my own personal experience. Um, and I'm drinking coffee this afternoon. I never drink coffee afternoon, but we went away the last two nights to go skiing because it's school break. I got two kids. <sighs> <laughs> I, I think I ended up on the floor the last two nights. Small, small room, small hotel room. Uh, <laughs> But um, so I, when I got out of school, uh, my first job was in Philadelphia. I was a, an assistant DA in Philadelphia. And I don't know if anybody's really familiar here with Philly. I didn't know anything about Philadelphia. I wanted to, I wanted to be a prosecutor. And they offered me a job, uh, I think, January of my third year of law school. And I was like, wow, I, 
like, you give me a job and I want to do this, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> and Philadelphia, um, at least at the time, and I think it still is, was a majority minority city, meaning it was, it was majority African American. Most of the lawyers were white. Um, and as a baby prosecutor, you used to have to go to what's called precincts to do preliminary hearings. And I used to have to go to this place called 17th and Montgomery up in North Philadelphia. And North Philadelphia, at that time, and I think probably still, is pretty rough. Temple, Temple University. Yeah, right by Temple University, absolutely. And as I said, I grew up, I grew up in the South End. I grew up on Bayview Street. Um, which is a nice street and in the south end of Burlington. The bottom of my street was a church. Uh, five blocks uh, south was, uh, I, call it, I still call it South Park, now Callahan Park. Christ the King was down there. You go the five blocks the other way, I went to Edmonds uh, Elementary. You could go to Smalley Park. You could walk down to Lange Brothers Market where I worked at as a kid. I mean, it was a true community. I saw none of that at 17th and Montgomery. Um, I saw, I think for the first time, real poverty, bl blight. And what I saw was uh, boarded up buildings, uh, trash, graffiti. I didn't see any schools. Uh, I didn't see any parks. Uh, I didn't see any churches. Um, and public safety, to me, in large part, is defined as do you perception, do you feel safe? I didn't feel safe. And every day I'd go to court and I would prosecute young African American men uh, for possession of crack cocaine. And it was what was called a PWID, a PWID charge, P-W-I-D, possession with intent to deliver. And the significance of that charge was it carried a mandatory minimum sentence. Mm -hmm. Meaning it was just based on weight. How much did you have? And if you had a certain threshold, you got state time and state time was tough. And if you were below that threshold, you got county time, and county time was a little bit easier to do. I was 24, 25 years old. I didn't have a clue. And every single day, I'd go to this, and it was at a police station, and I would prosecute young African-American men for that charge. And every single day, I'd walk through this neighborhood not feeling physically safe, not seeing any of those assets, those community assets, that I defined a neighborhood as from my own experience. Churches, schools, parks, trees, sidewalks, businesses, healthcare, you name it. I didn't see any of it. Every single day I'd do this. And finally one day I'm sitting there in court, looking around, I finally said to myself, if I grew up here, I might be doing the same thing these guys are. We're all products of our environment. We are all products of our environment. And I think when we look at that and acknowledge that fact, and then you look who ends up in the criminal justice system, it absolutely does matter about where people are raised, the homes they're raised in. I'm a big believer, and I'm not an expert on this, but I'm a big believer in understanding trauma and understanding adverse childhood experiences. And adverse childhood, and this is what prosecutors and judges really got to understand. Because, you know, my wife is a mental health counselor, and she talks about this stuff a lot. And I'm lucky because I learn, because I wouldn't have a clue. And essentially, adverse childhood experiences basically are these. That if you grow up, and it's zero to five, the early years, whatever happens in that house, whatever happens to that child during those first three to five years, it charts your entire life path. Higher rates of addiction, higher rates of uh, mental illness, less life expectancy. And so I went to this talk like this and on ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences, and he was saying, you know, people who grew up in stressful homes, um, you, know, you know, the stress is so toxic that it has these lifelong impacts. And I raised my hand and said, now wait a minute. I grew up in a big Irish Catholic family. We know dysfunction. We know dysfunction. And, and, and last time I checked, I'm a big believer in perseverance and resiliency and overcoming. And the presenter just looked at me and said, you don't get it. We're not talking about your dysfunction. 
We're talking about watching your mother get beat. We're talking about watching your mother be passed out because of addiction. We're talking about such extreme poverty that you don't know whether or not you're going to eat, and that you don't feel safe. And that stress is so toxic that it changes your physical makeup and mental makeup. And so when we talk about public safety and talk about those issues of inequality, I really do believe that access to health care is probably the biggest thing in terms of making sure that we change what it means for people uh, to ha truly have an opportunity uh, to be successful in this community. Because, and this is, guys, this is all anecdotal for me. And there's probably people who could come up here and talk about stats and science and do a better job, but, you know, I'd be in court. We'd be on the third generation of a family. We'd be on the third generation of a family. You ask yourself, why is it? Why is it? And I'll tell you a quick story. Um, so when I was 18 years old, I got drunk and I got into a fight. And I got arrested. And it was a searing experience for me uh, because I was ashamed, I was embarrassed. Uh, can, to this day, can still remember two things about that night. Um, <laughs> I can remember my father picking me up at the police station <laughs> and the ride home, yep. Um, but I also can remember sitting at the top of our stairs listening to my mother cry, um, worried about me and what I had done. But the long story short, uh, my future was protected. My father was a lawyer. Uh, we weren't rich, but we had resources. Uh, we had social capital. You know, I came from quote unquote, you know, a good family, and my future was protected. I got what's called a deferred sentence, which means if you stay out of trouble, essentially, not only would the case be dismissed, but it would be expunged, meaning it would be erased. And you, the legal answer is no, never happened. And so fast forward 20 years, and I'm state's attorney, and I'm a big believer in expungements expunging old criminal histories because criminal convictions and criminal records, number one, I think are the most misleading documents in the criminal justice because it goes back to where'd you grow up? The police come down your street at night or not? All these, all these variables. But criminal records also marginalize folks because you're answering that question and that label of your worst moment of your life, you are judged by that moment because the record says so. Incredibly unfair, incredibly arbitrary. And when you go and apply for that job 10 years down the road and you have to answer the question, have you ever been convicted of a crime? And you have to answer yes because you stole that 12 pack of beer 13 years ago that was 9.99, but you're labeled as a thief. And that prospective employer is only gonna see the fact, the fact that you're a thief not, none, of the, none of the facts, none of the circumstances, and I'm a believer in expunging that. And so these petitions used to come to me as state's attorney. And now as attorney general, we go around the state and do expungement clinics because I actually believe in giving people an opportunity to get back to work, impacts housing, impacts education, certainly impacts employment. I'm a big believer of it. But I'm at my desk one day, and all the stories, by the way, and you'd have to, the, the petitioner would always have to kind of write a little story about why they deserved or why they needed the expungement. And I gotta tell you, it was always about a job. It was always about a job. And one day, I'm reading one and I recognize the name. It's a Burlington kid, kid from my class. Kid who probably had a completely different experience than me. And he's probably 40 years old at this time, maybe a little bit older. And he was trying to get an assault conviction for getting a fight, for getting into a fight 20 years ago. And it just stunned me. And again, it brought home the disparity in the treatment of the haves and the haves not. That, and Chippy, if I said his name, you'd recognize the last name. Yeah. And I 
I remember playing freshman football with this kid. I didn't know what was going on with him, and I don't think he even stuck with the team. You know, probably a red flag. But if we're judging at 14 years old, which way somebody's life is going to go, that one kid who gets into a fight can get to be state's attorney and attorney general, and another kid who didn't have any money, whose father wasn't a lawyer, who quote unquote came from one of those families, who grew up in the poor area of town, even in this community, that's a flawed system. That's what we gotta change. And that's what we're working to change, to address these issues. Because I think at the end of the day, we all believe in fairness. We all believe in opportunity. I certainly believe in redemption. Uh, I've gotten, I, I, I always acknowledge this, I never got a second chance. I got a third, fourth, and fifth chance growing up. And I think that's what we have to extend. We have to believe in alternatives to incarceration. We have to believe in community programming. We have to believe that arresting people uh, who suffer from mental illness and addiction isn't the way to do it. And it's certainly not to have a prosecutor who has no life experience sitting at the bar of court, making and has no clinical experience making a diagnosis of mental illness or addiction. That's what happens at the criminal justice system. And the prescription is usually a jail term or a probation term. It's a failed system, it's gotta change. So as attorney general, the, one of the first things that I did when I started was to start uh, a community justice division that did not exist before. And the role of the community justice division was to kind of standardize across the state all these alternatives so we didn't have these issues of geographic injustice in this state. Because depending on where you grew up in this state, that determined what alternatives existed. If you were from Rutland, maybe you didn't get an alternative that you had if you grew up in Burlington. And so we now have, in every county, three different alternatives. Standard diversion, kind of low-level diversion, first-time offender. Uh, we have uh, what we call the TAMRAC program, which is based on a I'm going to screw this up, a tree in Vermont that is really nice and rejuvenates itself every year, like most trees. Um, it's a great program. More for folks who suffer from mental illness and addiction to be, to be treated in the community, not in the criminal justice system. And then we have what's called a pretrial services program, which gets people set up with services during the pendency of their case so they're not waiting 9, 10, 12 months to get drug treatment, to get mental uh, health treatment. And I'm happy to report that in every county, all the numbers are up. And we have a long way to go, uh, but I think we've made significant strides in leveling out the playing field and really trying to change the culture of law enforcement, to change the culture of the criminal justice system uh, that is one that is truly um, based on risk. Look. Some people deserve to go to jail because they do terrible things. That's a small percent of the folks in our system. The vast majority of those folks that are gonna struggle with addiction, who are gonna struggle with mental illness, and all those societal ills that we talk about, it, the safety net shouldn't be the criminal justice system. Um, that's been a big part of my work. Uh, how much time do I have, Sandy? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Um, let, let me talk about uh, the Kaya Morris case. So Kaya Morris was a state representative uh, in, who represented Bennington, Vermont, uh, and had received uh, online racial harassment uh, on public domain um, platforms like Twitter and, and whatnot. The Bennington police, and uh, there were allegations that her house was burglarized in October of 2016, and uh, that a GPS was stolen, and that she had uh, been harassed by one individual, uh, one named individual. In December of 2016, uh, she applied for a civil restraining order in Superior Court in Bennington County, and it was granted. Is that 17? 
I'm getting my dates wrong here. Um, in that was I, I apologize. That was in the burglary was in in October of 16. Uh, the allegation of, of burglary and GPS were in October of 2016. Uh, in December of 2017, she, she applied for that restraining order and it was granted. In July of 2018, uh, she received another online um, harassment. In August of 2018, she reported that her and her husband received a death threat an online death threat uh, on their computer. Uh, there were allegations that Bennington police were not responding, that the prosecutor was not responding, um, and we took the case, as I said earlier, we had concurrent jurisdiction. We could go in and take the case, uh, and we took it on that death threat case, on the online death threat of August of 2018. <coughs> We brought in the Vermont State Police that have a forensic computer forensic team to examine that online death threat. We determined through the Vermont State Police investigation that there was no online death threat. That in fact, her husband had recently purchased a used laptop computer. And the laptop computer's previous owner was a 10 year old boy uh, who played video games. Sometimes you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and the 10-year-old boy's screen name was Dead Dead. And Dead Dead. And the previous owner's cloud account still linked to the laptop. And so when they opened it up or turned it on, it would come up Dead Dead. And I want to be really clear, perfectly reasonable, given what was going on at the time, for them to think that it was a threat. And we determined that it wasn't a threat. In fact, it was the 10-year-old boy's previous screening. <laughs> we then said, well, why don't we look at these other allegations, given what has gone on? In terms of the burglary of October 2016, and the GPS, the theft of the GPS in October 2016. And this is, we took the case in September of 2018, so now we're two years out. No evidence to corroborate any eyewitness to identify anybody. No physical evidence, no corroborated evidence whatsoever. So there was insufficient evidence to say this person committed a burglary or this person stole the GPS. And two years after the fact, absent that evidence, you can't go back and manufacture evidence. So then it was, well, what about these online threats? Uh, does Vermont have a criminal statute that would address these, what are viewed as online racial harassment? And it was racial harassment. And I condemn it, it was demeaning, it was derogatory, it was terrible. The legal question was, are those statements, do they rise to the level of what's called a criminal threat in Vermont? And so the first thing you have to determine is, well, what's a criminal threat? And a criminal threat is essentially what's called a true threat. And that is a legal term that the Supreme Court has said is an exception to the First Amendment's protected speech. So now we're into the First Amendment, and we're into protected speech. And the question is, is there an exception to protected speech? And yes, there are. Number one, first one is, is it a true threat? Well, what's a true threat? A true threat has to be an explicit threat of physical harm. It has to be a serious intention of placing somebody in fear of death or serious bodily injury. And then you add in the fact that Ms. Morris was a public official. And the standard gets a little bit higher. And so then we said, well, well let's look at the, we have to look at the statements. And the first statement essentially was uh, an individual mocking 
um, how an African American would speak. Clearly racist, uh, but not a threat. Doesn't rise to the level of a criminal threat. The next statement was essentially mocking uh, the hairstyle of an African American woman. Clearly racist, demeaning, derogatory, but not a threat. The third message, the question was, the statement was, after that restraining order had expired. Remember that restraining order was issued in December of 17, for a year. In July of 18, so then we're 19 months out. Statement is something along the lines of this. You'll never silence me. I'm gonna troll you, and if you're at a public forum, I'm gonna show up and maybe I'm gonna bring my friends. So then we apply that statement to that standard of did that statement constitute a serious intention of placing somebody in death or serious bodily injury. I'm just gonna grab my chair here, I'm feeling old. Um, and how you interpret, how you interpret that is to say, what, what, what has case law said is a serious intention of death or serious bodily injury? of placing that person in death or serious bodily injury. And that standard's really high. And one case was President Obama, when he was candidate Obama, somebody posted to a public message board a racist rant and something along the lines of, you know, put a 50 cal in your head. The court said that's protected speech. There was another case where Christine Gregoire was the governor of Washington. Somebody threatened or wished sexual violence upon her daughter. And that quote, she should burn at the stake like any heretic. The court said that's protected speech. So then you say, well, wh what is a true threat? And a true threat was something the court has found, one case where somebody said they were going to bomb a building and had detailed plans. I said, okay, that's maybe a, a, th a threat or something that was as direct as intentional as I'm, go I'm gonna kick your you know what. And when we looked at that statement of I'm gonna troll you, That's probably, I think it is, not probably, political speech. I'm gonna follow you online. And you're an elected official, and I get to criticize you as an elected official, or, or I get to support you because that's my constitutional right to engage in that political platform, okay? And if you're at a public forum, I'm gonna show up. politician at a public forum and somebody saying I'm gonna show up that's gonna be protected constitutional speech and maybe I'll bring my friend or three friends I don't think that statement and I don't like it I want to be very clear rises to the level of a serious intention of placing a person in fear of death or serious bodily injury, that it's not an explicit threat of harm. It's terrible, but it doesn't rise to the level of breaching the protected speech status of the First Amendment. And here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. We talk a lot about the rule of law right now in this country. Rightfully so. We have sued the federal government numerous times 
because we think they've breached the rule of law. And my message is very simple. That standard applies to me too. That I have to prosecute people based on evidence, based on facts, and based on the precedent of the rule of law. Not because I dislike somebody, not because I disagree with them, not because I'm offended by them. Because that is an incredibly dangerous system to have. And it's a slippery slope to say that the person in power, the chief law enforcement officer, gets to choose who he prosecutes, not on facts, not on evidence, but based on political belief and based on likes or dislikes. That standard, I am a, and the, the issue of racism, racism is real. The issue, I don't believe, and I also want to point one thing out too. In 2016, when I was state's attorney before I was elected uh, attorney general, I brought a case to court. And in that case, facts were very different. I still think they're good facts. Where a member of the KKK here in Burlington was handing out flyers. And if he was handing out flyers to every one of us that walked out of this room today on Dorset Street, on a public street, and handed us flyers, I would defend his right to do that. I don't like it, I disagree with it, I condemn it. But he has that right to do that. Now in the Burlington case, he was handing out flyers. But the evidence was that only two people in the entire south end of Burlington received those flyers. They happened to be two women of color. And the flyer was a picture of a Klansman on a horse uh, with some rhetoric. I can't recall, like, join the Klan and something else. I charged him. I said, that's a threat. Because it's directed to women of color. <laughs> Not to all of us. I lost that case at the Vermont Supreme Court. That that wasn't a threat. And when you look at those facts, when you look at the facts of those other cases, and you look at the language on a public domain to an elected official, it doesn't rise to the level of a criminal threat, in my opinion. The standard is incredibly high. And you look at some of those decisions from the past, and you look at the authors of those decisions, whether it was Thurgood Marshall or Justice William Brennan, civil rights advocates themselves, who have always who said that speech that's even offensive, that is vehement, that offends us, is protected because you want a robust political debate. You want that, you want the openness of the political discourse even when it's offensive to us. It was not an easy decision. I didn't make the decision lightly. And I know it was an unpopular decision, but it was the right legal decision. And I don't believe in chipping away at our Constitution and the rights that protect every single one of us because of political expediency. That is the absolute wrong message to send, particularly in this political climate. This isn't the time to disregard our Constitution or our constitutional rights. It is actually the time to follow our rights and demonstrate that the rule of law is not always convenient. It's not always pretty. It doesn't always work, that our country is an imperfect country, but we are, in the words of Lincoln, striving for a more perfect union. 
and we're not going to get to a just and reasonable society simply by arresting people because we disagree with them. That work happens in the community. That work happens by condemning racism and working to provide opportunity for folks who have been marginalized. So these are tough decisions, but they're decisions that I feel strongly about. Um, I wish it were different, but you go by the facts and you go by the evidence and you follow the law. And I just want to say this, that, that, that Constitution, as I said, it applies to all of us, even people we disagree with and dislike. That's the strength of this country. And we don't violate people's constitutional rights even when they've done horrific things. That murder suspect, when he's arrested, I'm going to tell you what the police are going to do. They're going to do everything they can not to violate his Fourth Amendment rights. I'm going to tell you what the prosecutor's going to do. They're going to do everything to make sure that they don't prosecute his Fifth Amendment rights. I'm going to tell you what the judge is going to do. They're going to do everything they can to make sure they don't prosecute his Sixth Amendment rights. This is the job. This is the rule of law. That's why I made that decision, and I'm happy to take questions because I know it's 45 minutes. Um, I have two. One is a statement, and I was under the impression that the uh, person who she, who was the who 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 sent the messages. Uh, proudly admitted to doing these acts. Yep. And so I w wondered how that fit in. But secondly, what then is hate speech? Yeah. Great question. Um, hate speech is exactly that, hate speech, w what I just outlined. I think hate, hate speech by itself is not a crime. When people talk about hate crimes, hate crimes in Vermont is what's called a sentence enhancer. So you have a crime, call it disorderly conduct. And if it was motivated by race or animus towards race or gender, then you would have that hate crime enhancement on the penalty. And so the crime that we looked at was a criminal threatening statute, which gets you into, is that a true threat to make it an exception to the prote to protected speech. And the individual, and I gotta be a little careful because there is a pending case, um, did admit to it. But if it's protected speech, and, and thank you so much. Is it warm in here? Yeah. A little bit? Yeah. I'm happy to take other questions. You want the mic? You want the mic? <laughs> They're supposed to give it to me. <laughs> I don't want to take yours. So, um, TJ, thanks for talking about how you're working to reform the, the court system. Um, I know you're not in charge of the prisons. <laughs> I'm sure you're glad about that. but. Um, can you speak about, are you doing any, you know, there's a lot of reform efforts that the legislature's looking at right now. Is there any part that you play in this, want to yeah. play in this, and sure. could you speak to that for just yeah. a minute? So there is a lot of work going on in, in the legislature about our correctional system, and the big debate is essentially how do we stop contracting with out-of-state prison prisons? And that's about 250 people, as I said, and that's, that's, so we have capacity of 1,500 in the state. We got about 1,700 um, total. Let me start with the good news, that we are essentially 30% less than what our proje projected incarceration rate was going to be. And I think it was either the Pew Group or one of those organizations 
we're thirty percent less. That that's great because we've done a lot of these alternatives, and that's 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 wonderful. The question is, how do you get below fifteen hundred? Because that means you don't have to contract with with out of state uh, prison companies. There's no easy answer. I think the big one is housing. Um, many people. So the general rule is, once you've hit your minimum sentence, so you get a, you get a sentence. Call it you know one to three years. Okay. Well, that one is your minimum. Three is your maximum. And on your minimum, you're eligible for release. And then you come out usually on what's called furlough, then to parole, and then, you, then you're out. Then you're done. There is a debate about how many people are held past their minimums. And here's the thing. You're eligible for release at your minimum sentence. And depending on the day, there's about 150 people who are held past their minimums for lack of housing. And then you say, well, what do you mean lack of housing? They gotta live somewhere. So there's a condition by the Vermont Department of Corrections that says you must have like adequate or suitable housing. I think the actual term is adequate housing. I really struggle with that because it's a middle class definition of what adequate housing is. And you get back to the point of it's mostly poor, poor folks in jail, well, they never had adequate housing to begin with. Here's what I would do if I was in charge for a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would invest in transitional housing, mm -hmm. like Dismas House. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing program, and it works. You got to give, pe and here's the thing. It's in our collective best interest, not only public safety, but economically, to have people be successful when they come out of jail. And here's the thing about jail. The vast majority of people are getting out. They're getting out. And they're coming back. Let's make it successful. We love to talk about Montpelier results-based accountability. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> it's a fancy term to make sure that we're spending our taxpayer dollars wisely in terms of our, our budgeting process down there. Well, what does that mean for, for corrections? It means the recidivism rate, mm -hmm. right? Well, the recidivism rate's over 50%, which means five out of 10 people who are in jail go back in jail within three years. Now put that price tag back on it. 79 grand for a woman, 60 grand for a man. It's outrageous. Mm -hmm. Let's invest in transitional housing. And, and more, I think a lot of people being held have mental health issues. Absolutely. And they can't just let them live anywhere, and there isn't any place for them to go. Is that correct? A absolutely. Okay, sorry. The, the issue of mental health, I, I think, is really a silent epidemic in, in this state. It, it is everywhere. And we have to, uh, one of the things that I've been doing with a gentleman by the name of John Broderick, who's the former Chief Justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court, we've been traveling around, and he started in New Hampshire, and um, I brought him to Vermont. We've done about five schools. Uh, he's got an amazing personal story. His son suffered, suffers from mental illness, and assaulted him, almost killed him. Um, really a tragic story, but a story um, that is, out of that tragedy, again comes forgiveness and love and redemption but to raise awareness about mental illness and to wash away the stigma about it and to go to because look here's a sad commentary on our state our suicide rate is higher than the national average and so we've been going around to vermont high schools talking about it and saying you don't have to be embarrassed you don't have to be ashamed uh, most people have it in their family mm -hmm. i have it in my family um, and it's really hard. Well, again, take that middle class family who has the health insurance or has the resources to get help. You're never going to get into the criminal justice system. Take the poor, and that first intervention is going to be the criminal justice system. And then you go into that issue of trauma, particularly with women, um, on violence. It is a perfect storm, and we have a lot of work to do. Uh, it's got to be community-based. If we're waiting to do it in the jail system, we've waited too long, um, and we got we got much more work to do. So, thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, 
when, when I was in school, they said uh, calling fire in a crowded yeah. theater yeah. was uh, yeah. not, uh, not protected, uh, your terminology, yeah. not protected. Uh, is, that, is that true? Yeah, so that, that's the, the famous case. Um, yelling theater in a crowded, in a, in a theater, you can't do it. That's been overturned. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the facts the facts on that are really interesting. And Chippy's going to help me out here because I'm going to get my history wrong. <laughs> um, those 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 that was during I think World War One or thereabouts, and it was two individuals that were essentially they were communists and they were trying to. Um, have people join the Communist Party. And it was against, I think, the Sedition Act. Yeah, it, was, so, yeah, it was Eugene Debs trying to get people to speak out against the war yeah. and, and resist the war. Yep. Yeah. And think about that for a second. It, remark, the, the, I mean, so the, the history, and you go into the, the history of these cases, that's why, I mean, I, I really have great reverence f for the law and the Constitution. Um, because you think about this, that might have been 1919, thereabouts, right? Somebody who was speaking out against a war was prosecuted. And the analogy of you can't yell fire in a crowded theater was essentially saying you can't, when, when the country is at war, uh, essentially, advocate against it. And I think that was um, Oliver Wendell Holmes used. That was his quote. And I think all of us today, a hundred years later, would say, of course, you, that's freedom of speech and freedom of, of expression to advocate against our country's entry or engagement in a war that we disagree with. But a hundred years ago, we said it wasn't. And so the Brandenburg decision, if any of you are having trouble sleeping tonight, <laughs> I think it was Brandenburg v. Ohio actually overruled that case in that language that I used to cite the standard of that serious intention of placing a person in fear of death or serious bodily injury, incredibly high, was part of the Brandenburg decision which overruled that earlier Kate Yell fire in a crowded theater. And I also want to say that's an objective standard. It's not a subjective standard, okay? If it was a subjective standard, it would be different. So we're, we're also engaged in the Vermont legislature trying to address this issue. Is there a way to craft legislation, given the world we're in, to address this type of hate speech. That, and you're absolutely right in, in, in describing that. While making sure it does not violate our First Amendment. It is hard, but we're trying to figure it out. But the last thing I don't think we want to do, and I feel strongly about this, is that Yes, we want to protect everybody, but we don't want to chip away or erode our rights because of the political climate we're in. That I think, and, and I'm not opposed to taking a case up to the Supreme Court. I did it with a KKK case, I'll do it again, but it's gotta be the right case. There's a saying in the law that I believe, bad facts make bad law. <laughs> so you wanna have the right case. And you want to make sure, and people have said, well, you know, what about, you know, you got to test the, you got to test the, um, the court system to change. And I agree with that. So he said, well, what about the, you know, Brown versus Board of Education? I said, absolutely, I agree with that. But those cases are so carefully selected and the record is made years, if not decades in advance. And it is an orchestrated attempt of changing precedent. I'm not opposed to that. This wasn't the case, based on the facts, uh, because the standard's so high. Yes. Hey, thank you for the question. Thank you, Chippy, for the 
history lesson as well. Uh, I want to get back to this uh, case in Bennington. Yeah. Uh, you're, a, you're an attorney. You're looking at it from the standpoint of the law, which I certainly understand. And I appreciate the fact that you're bringing up this case. Uh, I've done a little bit of reading about it, and it seemed to me that another way to look at this, again, maybe not from a lawyer's standpoint, but from the, the uh, person's standpoint who is the object of all of this bad language. And I would look at it from the standpoint of uh, how had her life changed? Did she have to change her uh, uh, kind of her schedule, her, what, what she does on a daily basis. It also meant that she resigned from the legislature. And I, there may have been extenuating reasons for that as well. Was she afraid for her own safety? I would factor those in. And again, correct me if I'm wrong from a legal standpoint, yeah. but if it's, a, if it's a person of sound mind who has to make uh, changes to their lives because of this, that's got to be factored in as well. Yeah. I, I appreciate the question. And you take everything into account. But it's the, it's, when you're doing the legal analysis, you're applying the facts. What are the allegations of the facts that the potential wrongdoer did, right? And did those violate that standard? And the subjective part, it's more, it's more of an objective standard. And what you hear throughout the law is a reasonable person standard. And that objective person standard, not really the subjective, this is how it made somebody feel, more the objective of that reasonable person. Now. Here's a great point, and I, I think this is probably where we're going on this, not in this case, but perhaps in the future. Does that reasonable person standard take into account the historical legacy of racism? Does it take in the historical trauma, which is real, of the African American experience? I think those are real questions that we want to test the system on. And those are things that I'm interested in doing with the caveat of what I just said, that it's got to be the right case. And I, that is not to sound insincere. I'm probably talking too much like a lawyer right now. But the, the, you want the facts to do that, and I, th and I think you need and I, I hate doing this with a camera on too, but uh, <laughs> because I, I don't want to sound in, insincere about this, by just, because this is how lawyers talk. But you're looking through for that explicit threat, and you you didn't have it in this case. You didn't have an explicit threat, and if you didn't have an explicit threat of harm, you don't have a case. You don't have a charge, and so. How do you address that precedent through the legislative process, number one, or when you get real close on a case to that explicitness, if that's the right word, then to bring in the evidence of, of, of that d does the African American experience, has it been taken into account in terms of that definition of what that objective reasonable person standard is? I think that's the question. I think that's the next challenge, and that's something that, that I'm very focused on um, because I think it should be done. And I think those are the cases that you put up and, and push. Uh, <clears throat> um, you mentioned the Supreme Court and also second and third chances. Yeah. I wanted to uh, go to the Kavanaugh yeah. situation. Um, did you think that that was fair for, um, for her to bring up those uh, charges? And it seems to me that, you know, getting drunk or shoplifting when you were a kid is a little different from, 
you know, molest, molesting someone. Yeah, I, well, I agree with you. I think shoplifting is I mean, very different than sexual assault. Um, I thought it was fair. And um, I don't think he should have been confirmed. Um, and I'll tell you why. Um, that the temperament he displayed and the allegation that it was political, his words, not mine, uh, disqualified him as a judge, in my opinion, period. And so you name any party that's going to go in front of him that may be of that political persuasion or may be a victim in a sexual assault case, they're going to have doubt that they're going to get a fair hearing. And I think that was the disqualifier for me. Boy, I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And if you just hang around a few minutes, you might get a few more questions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for having me.